I think we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. It is 6.30, maybe even a couple, maybe a minute or two after that. And uh, if you're watching with us online tonight, so, gla- so glad you are with us this evening as we continue our study called It Matters. And uh, tonight we're going to just, we're continuing our journey through some of these foundational ideas, and we're kind of letting uh, something called the Baptist Faith the Message kind of guide our studies over the last few weeks, looking at the things that are in that as a way of kind of shaping what we're looking at and uh, those things that we're looking at as being fairly important to have a foundational understanding about. Last week, we looked at salvation, what, what it means to be saved, and we, uh, we looked at four things in particular. We looked at uh, the the regeneration, justification, sanctification, and glorification. Essentially, this this idea that God gives us new life, He births in us new life, He makes us right with Him, and then He makes us holy. He sanctifies us in ultimate glorification. That is, we are glorified and we'll be resurrected one day, restored to how God meant us to be. That's all the parts of... of, um, uh, of salvation we looked at last night. Before we get too much further tonight, I want to do a couple things. One, we're going to pray real quick. And then secondly, I want uh, a couple of you guys, if you would, I know I'm popping this on you. I would like a couple of you guys tonight who could give us, just a, having talked about salvation last week, we're going to be talking a little bit about that again tonight. Uh, be ready for a three to five minute, maybe even a little shorter if you want to do it shorter, testimony about how you came to faith in Christ, your salvation testimony. If a couple of you guys would be willing to do that, that would really be great. So let's pray, and then we'll see who volunteers first. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we are grateful tonight for the opportunity to be reminded of what it is you have done for us and, and how important it is and how important understanding it is. So Lord, as we go throughout our evening, I pray that your spirit would guide us, that we would have a, uh, that we'd be a strengthened and encouraged as we look at what you have done for us. And even as we perhaps remember our own, uh, our own story about how we came to faith in Jesus, that, Lord, you would use that tonight to just, uh, just renew us. Lord, would you do all these things we've asked about and guide us tonight? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was nine. I, I, I mean, I, I grew up in church. I don't re- remember ever not being in church. Somewhere there are nursery workers who had me as a baby in church. That's just, you know, that's where I was raised in that. That's how I came and the things, but all that being said, uh, I remember about nine years old. Uh, I was we were we actually had revival services at the rodeo center in Springdale, Arkansas. So somewhere in the rodeo center, we were out there, and, um, and I just remember n- the, the the process of my mind at nine years old wasn't overly complex, uh, but I remember r- realizing that. My parents had something in their lives that I knew was different than what I had. I, they, they had something I didn't have, and I wanted what that was. And I came to understand that being Christ himself. And so, you know, the Lord, through the example of my parents and through them sharing with me, gave me an understanding, even at nine years old, of what it was I needed to do to, to repent and to, to turn from my sins. Even though at nine years old, it wasn't like I had a long, you know, rap sheet or anything. Uh, but I, I remember through the witness of my parents, through the work of the Spirit, being drawn to asking Christ into my life. And so that's what I did. I, I, we were at the revival services, and I, I went down at the end and found my dad up front uh, and said, this is what I want to do, and, and prayed to receive Christ at that point in time. Short, sweet, simple. Nothing dramatic in, in, in some sense. But that's, that's, in a brief nutshell, how I came to know the Lord. If some of, would, would at least one or two of you not... Be willing to volunteer to share with us tonight how it is you came to faith in Christ. Yeah, Gary.
And for those of you watching online, I realize you probably didn't hear a word of that, and that's just going to be the way it is. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but it, I think that would probably reduce the amount of people willing to, <laughs> to share. <laughs> uh, somebody else, uh, just a, a quick testimony about how you came to faith in Christ. You're, and you're not online. You're, you, that's all right. Okay. Not, not just for the girlfriend's sake. <laughs> it can be. <laughs> um, both, both you guys, and even me at nine, even though I couldn't have expressed it at that point in time uh, you know, in quite the same way you, you guys did, both of you talked about you know, this understanding that despite what you had perhaps said or done in the past, that there was this understanding in your heart that you knew things weren't right. And you described it as an elephant. Uh, on, on your chest, I, I don't. You just, you just talked about it, Gary. You just knew it was just it hit you, and and so and this is a realization that's that happens to you. You're, I mean, you realize that there's a conviction. There's the, the Holy Spirit's doing something in you that you eventually go. I I have to get this taken care of, and so the activity of God is very present in all that thing, isn't it? It's, it's, it's amazing what God will do, the, the circumstances that God will put us in uh, so that we come to a realization of who He is, who we are, and what needs to be done. We, in talking about salvation last week, we talked about perhaps some of the mechanics. <laughs> we talked about it in kind of a mechanical way. Here, here's what God does. Here's, there's regeneration. There's the new birth. There's, there's justification. We're made right with God. There's sanctification. We're made holy. We're in the process of becoming more Christ-like. And glorification, that day when we will uh, be able to see Him face-to-face -face and realize the end result of our salvation. And that's going to be, glor I mean, glorification is a good word. It's, it's going to be glorious uh, when that day shows up. I'm anticipating that. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that. And so we, we described and talked about salvation in, in those steps. I want to talk a little bit this more this evening about not just the mechanics of it, but what is the purpose and how can we know for sure that this is, in fact, the real thing? Uh, both Jeff and Gary, and I've dealt with this even to my, to my extent, perhaps I, I think a lot of Christians have, how can I know for sure, for example, that I actually am saved or not saved? Um, is this something I even can know? In, in looking through the Baptist Faith and Message, the next thing we come to, after we talked about the salvation last week, is titled, God's Purpose in Grace. I'm going to read this for you, like we have been, and then we're going to explore it a little bit, all right? So this is, it's a, this is the paragraph under the heading, God's Purpose in, in, in Grace, or God's Purpose in Grace. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you right, the first word is going to make some people go, what? Just, just, you know, bear with me, all right? 
Election is the gracious purpose of God, according to which he regenerates, justifies, sanctifies, and glorifies sinners. It's consistent with the free agency of man and comprehends all the means in connection with the end. It's the glorious display of God's sovereign goodness and is infinitely wise, holy, and unchangeable. It excludes boasting and promotes humility. All true believers endure to the end. Those whom God has accepted in Christ and sanctified by His Spirit will never fall away from the state of grace, but shall persevere to the end. Believers may fall into sin through neglect and temptation, whereby they grieve the Spirit, impair the graces and comforts, and bring reproach on the cause of Christ, and temporary judgments on themselves, yet they shall be kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Now, let me just sum up that last paragraph in particular in the, uh, the, in the, the Baptist phrase, uh, eternal security. Uh, so if, if, there are, if there is something that Southern Baptists or Baptists are kind of known for besides, you know, baptism, because that's, you know, in the name, <laughs> um, it probably is eternal security, or what some people call once saved, always saved. That's a, that's a good Baptist uh, bumper sticker right there. And uh, so this paragraph has to do with that. But let me, let me be, I, want, I, I, I wanted to begin with those testimonies tonight, because I think this is actually where we need to, need to look at. Um, and hopefully we all have a testimony tonight about what God has done to bring us to salvation. We have a story of, of what that takes place. But as we look at all this, let me ask you this question. I asked this a couple weeks ago, see if you remember this. When I asked, why are we created? Why did God make us? To worship Him, to glorify Him, to make His majesty, to make His glory known. And by this may not be a perfect illustration, but in the same way, I, 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 you, know, you can take natural creation, you can take the stars, and you can look at those things, and every one, every one of us has seen the sunset or the sunrise, uh, depending on when you get up, and, <laughs> and, and you find yourself amazed by the beauty and the artistry of what you see, and you go, how can you not believe that God is there? And you see those things in their own way, pointing to the reality of the God of Scripture. Well, there is a very real sense that you and I, if the stars, I would say, are able, were able to look at us, if they could look at us, the idea would be they would be amazed at the Creator by what they see in us, if it could, if it could go the other way around. That's kind of one way I like to think about it. We are created for the glory and the majesty of God. Whether and as those made in His image in particular, we have a unique role to play within that. Our lives are to glorify, reveal the character of God. So now let me take it to the next step. What is the purpose of salvation, of God saving us? To be His witnesses, okay? Absolutely. Any other ideas? Okay. Okay. Absolutely. These are all correct. I want to back up to what we just talked about, why we were created to begin with. The purpose of God saving us is also to do what? To glorify Him, to reveal Him. So there is something in salvation, in the redeeming act, and there's something in the knowing Him and relating to Him and enjoying Him forever, as we say, that glorifies and reveals the character of God. So, our creation is for, the, is for the glory of God. Our salvation is for uh, the glory of God. And that makes sense. I, I know I, I, maybe I was uh, trying to make it sound like it was complicated. It's actually pretty basic. And, but I think that's, that's a, something we need to, to remember, that even our salvation is for the glory of God. And it's accomplished through these things you all just 
just mentioned. So what is the purpose, the function of God's grace? Well, it is, it, His grace does, in fact, reveal the glory of God. Now, I want to begin, actually, with the second paragraph here that talks about, really, it, it, was, a, it was a wordy way uh, that you kind of needed to make sure you covered the, your bases of saying what we sometimes call the security of the believer, once saved, always saved, eternal security. Uh, the idea that we can not only uh, know if we're saved, but that once God saves us, that is a done deal. Um, now let me ask you this. Is it possible for us to know that we are saved? So that we can know that we can know that we can know. Okay. I mean, just based upon Gary and, and, and Jeff's testimony a while ago, that was actually, a, a, that question was actually kind of a, at the heart of what you guys experienced, wasn't it? The fact that you realized, you know, I, I know, and I know the answer is no. <laughs> um, how, I mean, if you don't mind answering the question, you don't have to answer it out loud. How many of you have ever struggled with or thought or wondered whether or not you really were saved? That's pretty much all of us, isn't it? Um, you know, I can say for me, I, I, was, I was saved at nine, and I know I was saved at nine. But I did struggle for a time, oftentimes, especially as a teenager, with whether or not I really was saved. And, and uh, I guess in hindsight, it really wasn't that long. But I, I remember going to uh, a youth camp called Super Summer in Texas. It was met at the campus of Baylor University. And uh, I was, uh, while attending this, our, our speaker was a guy named Rick Eubanks. I don't know if you've ever heard who Rick Eubanks is. At the time, he was, he was a youth pastor in Burleson. And... I was struggling at that point in time at that youth camp in July of 1984. <laughs> yeah, I was, yes, I was at youth camp in the 80s. <laughs> and and, um, and well, he, he taught on this a little bit. And in this case, it actually solidified, okay, I am saved. And it, it actually was an affirmation. What his teaching taught me through and what the Lord did was an affirmation for me that I actually was in fact saved and I honestly I really have not doubted it since other than that one time I really wondered whether God was real at all <laughs> but that was a different crisis um, but I haven't really doubted my salvation since because of what God did through Rick for me during that youth camp so almost every one of us have raised our hand at one point or another we wondered whether or not we were saved the letter of 1 John in the back of our New Testaments that book, that letter, let me just read for you one little quick thing out of the end of that, in the, in that letter. John has, has written to this church, and he's written about a number of different things. But at the end of the letter, he, John is wrapping up that little letter, and he says this in verse 13 of chapter 5. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of Son of God, so that, so he's writing these things, so that this will happen. So this is the purpose of why he's writing. So that you may know that you have eternal life. So the Apostle John has written this letter that we call 1 John, and his, his thesis, his, the reason he wrote the letter was so that those who are reading it would know they have eternal life. So that would seem to indicate to me that it is in fact possible to know that you have eternal life. That seem like a logical conclusion? I hope so. <laughs> that seems to be what John is going for. So it seems to be possible that we can, according to Scripture, know that we have the eternal life. And so the question is then, how can we know that? So let me just ask you this question real quick. How can I know I have eternal life? Now we could go back and do a first by verse study of 1 John. That would help us, but we're not going to do that in the next 10, 15 minutes. So... How can I know that I have eternal life? Okay. Okay, so go to Scripture. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I'll go back to Scripture, and I'm going to assume that at least part of what we're talking about is this, 
if I've done sincerely what Scripture is talking about, uh, and I'm not basing it upon a feeling, because the reality is, depending on what day of the week it is, depending on what you had for dinner, uh, depending upon what the girlfriend says, our feelings can change, can't they? And, and feelings some, sometimes have nothing to do with facts. Is that fair? So on those days when my feelings are all over the place, I need to rest, my, I need to rest the truth. I need to rest my understanding on facts, not my feelings. And Scripture presents facts. So I can go to Scripture and I can read that and I can trust what God has said is true. And so I can, based upon how I'm interacting with that truth, I can know based upon God's word that, you know, something is there. Okay? God can send us a sign. He can. Can you give me an example of that? Okay? He may, he may do something like that. Uh, God used signs in the New Testament. He got God used signs in the Old Testament. We talked about that. He... he I mean, Exodus, we're going through on Sunday mornings, God used all kinds of signs, didn't he? Now, we, again, one thing I mentioned on Sunday morning is that like all the signs that even Moses was a part of, the snake turning into a stick and, or, and vice versa, or the Red Sea opening up, all those signs that Moses had were always, and I mean always, also attached to God's Word. So God, God's signs always follow God's Word. So God says something in Scripture, and then the sign affirms that. The sign's never by itself. It always goes with God's word. But God does use signs sometimes. Yeah. Leading in the spirit. Okay. So can you describe that for me a little bit? Okay. So there's a sense that, and, and the scriptures talk about this, that our spirit will um, sync up with, if, if like, for like the modern term, <laughs> the Spirit of God, the two will testify and affirm one another that we belong to Him and are, that we're guided. I mean, Christ Himself says He's given us the Spirit. And this is actually a pretty crucial one. I want to, now that Whitney's brought that up, if you will turn to 1 Corinthians. Well, I just lost my place here. <laughs> Y'all ever do typos? <laughs> uh, let's see here. That's not right. Okay, I lost my place here. All right. All right, just help me out here. I've completely lost my spot here. I can't find what I'm looking for at all. Well, okay. I'm going to sum it up by this. <laughs> God has given us his spirit as a seal. He even uses the word down payment at one point. You got it? Did you find it for me? Two six. Thank you. Why do I not have that written down there? Thank you. Appreciate that. I went. I was drawing a blank, and all of a sudden, you get in front of people and go, "I could not do." Happens to people like me too. First Corinthians two. Yeah, that's not quite the one. Okay, because I think it's the one I'm looking for. But we do have this though. Um, verse 10 
For it says, for who, who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that's from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. It's actually not the verse I was looking for, but it's good. <laughs> it, does, it, does, it describes exactly what you were talking about. Um, and on top of that, the scriptures talk about us, we as, a, as believers, that we are given the spirit as essentially what we might call a down payment, as a guarantee. So when you have a, when, you, when you're buying a house and you put down a, a payment, you put it in escrow, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you saying to the person you're going to buy the house from? It's a guarantee. And if I back out, you guys get to keep the money. <laughs> so you don't back out. It's, it's motive to, it, it is a dump. It's, it's a way of securing your guaranteeing that the end of the transaction is going to be completed. Well, one of the ways the scripture describes the spirit's role is that he is what God gives us as a guarantee that he will, in fact, finish the job. That he will, in fact, see us through to the end of our salvation. Because as we talked about last week, we have been, as of right now this evening, we have, if we are in, in faith, we have been regenerated. We have been justified. We are in the process of being sanctified. We have not been glorified yet. That's still to come. But God has given us His Holy Spirit as a, as a, as a down payment, as a security to ensure that we know that's coming. I don't have to wonder if it's coming. It's coming. God always finishes what He starts. He always completes the deal. As we're looking at in Exodus right now, God made a covenant with Abraham to do what? What did God tell Abraham he was going to do through Abraham and his descendants? Yeah, give them the promised land and ultimately be uh, people who end up being a blessing to all other nations. So God made all these promises to Abraham. Now, did Abraham see all of them happen? No. But when God is acting through Moses and bringing Israel out of Egypt, what's he doing? He's keeping the promise that he made hundreds of years before to Abraham. Not because the people in captivity in Egypt are all that great, because they, they're a bunch of whiners, but because he made a promise to Abraham. And when we enter into a, our salvation under a covenant of faith in Christ with God, we have now entered into a covenant as surely as Abraham and Israel were under a covenant. And God keeps his covenants, doesn't he? So we enter into that covenant through Christ, and we say, my life belongs to you, and God says, I am rescuing you, I am redeeming you, you're mine, and this is what's going to happen. We can know that he will keep it as surely as he has kept everything else he's ever said. So the Spirit is part of that. That's a, that's a guarantee. So we talk about eternal security. We're talking about security of the believer. We talk about the phrase that's used here is perseverance. Um, now, security is kind of a safe, nice word. I like security. Anybody not like security? Okay, we like security. We like knowing that something is certain, right? Now, if I say the word perseverance, what comes to mind? Is perseverance as fun a word as security? No. Why is it perseverance as fun of a word as security? <laughs> it's a struggle. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 there, there's some uh, involved in perseverance, isn't there? Security is just, okay, everything's going to be fine. But what's interesting is that the Bible actually kind of puts these two concepts together, and our better faith of message kind of does this as well. All believers endure to the end. If I use the word endurance, what comes to mind? What's that? Forever. <laughs> okay, it's kind of it's, it's the same as, as perseverance, isn't it? It means I've got to withstand something, doesn't it? So we know on the one hand that there is security because of the promises and, and the covenant that God's made with us and that the Spirit is there to ensure that. But we also know that perseverance and endurance are part of this. Um, 
So there are some who believe that as Christians, we can lose our salvation, that we can be saved and then not be saved. Now, I, I want us to look at this a little briefly. We're, we're not going to get through everything I got prepared tonight because we're just not. <laughs> Why would there be those who believe that we can lose our salvation, that we might be saved one moment and then the next one not be? Why would someone think that? Well, maybe they don't know something. Okay, maybe they maybe they're with John and they you know like maybe they're one of the people that John's writing to. They just don't know if they're if they're saved or not. Okay. Okay. Let's look at some of these. There's three in particular. Hebrews chapter 6 is probably one of the more well-known ones. And we're going to look at these three tonight because I think it's important if we're looking at this to understand why things are, why people believe and why people think the way they do. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 4, the, the author of Hebrews says this, for in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. So, verses 4 and 5, that sure sounds like a Christian, doesn't it? I mean, it describes them in terms like um, enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift and tasted the good word of God and even partakers of the Spirit, sharers of the Holy Spirit. And then describes them as, as having fallen away. Um, boy, that, let's be honest, that's, that's what it sounds like, doesn't it? Um, let, me, let me read you another one here in 2 Peter chapter 2. It's a few pages over from Hebrews. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last fate has become worse for them than the first. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It's happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit. So Peter seems to be describing, at first glance, someone that has left the entanglements of the world, as he describes it, and then returned to it. And he says, if that happens to them, they're worse off now than if they've never come to begin with. Um, so... Those two passages present us with a couple things that make us go, huh, <laughs> right? If you can't lose your salvation, then what are these two passages uh, talking about? So understand that those who believe you can lose your salvation aren't just making that up. They look at these two passages and think to themselves, well, that seems to be what's being described here. Now, that being said, are there passages, again, that talk about how we are secure? Romans chapter 8. We'll do a little scripture hopping this night, this evening. In Romans chapter 8, verse 31, Paul writes this. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over us or over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God's the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he is he who died. Yes, rather was raised who is at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us who will separate us from the love of Christ will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword 
just as it's written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long, we're considered a sheep to be slaughtered. And all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. I am convinced that neither death, life, angels, principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, depth, any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God. That's pretty definitive, isn't it? Um, let me take you to John chapter 6, the Gospel of John. In John chapter 6, beginning around verse 37, Jesus says this, All that the Father gives me, speaking of people, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all of he, that all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus kind of gives us this pattern. The Father gives him someone, they come to him, he, they, are, they are rescued, they are redeemed, they are saved, and everyone who comes to him, he keeps. And no one gets away. Now, by the way, there are a lot of these. Um, actually, a lot more than the two we looked at that kind of say the opposite. There's a whole lot of these. Not to mention that I would argue the entire pattern of God's activity from Genesis on speaks to him always finishing and completing what he started. So we might, and, with, and it's not the goal that I had to get into a long, drawn-out study of the Hebrews passage and the Second Peter passage. But um, if we're looking at the entirety of Scripture, we recognize that God repeatedly says he finishes what he starts, that those who come to him are secure and won't be dismissed, will not be cast out, won't be won't leave, that nothing can separate from the, the, the completed work of God. So how do we begin to understand those other two passages that seem to indicate that something's different? Other than they are, in fact, dire warnings. And I would say this, I think, at least, uh, in, especially in the Hebrews case in particular, that there is a sense that what's happening in those passages is there is this idea, in Hebrews in particular, the whole book of Hebrews is written to Jewish Christians who are being pressed and pressured to return to Judaism. That's the context. And I think what he's doing there is kind of using a little dramatic language to say, listen, you don't want to go back to that. It's going to be a bad deal if you do. And if you do, and I think he's kind of giving them a little shot across the bow here just to kind of scare them a little bit. Even if you were to go back, understand, here's what this means. That, interesting enough, that passage of Hebrews 6 is often used by groups who believe that you can lose your salvation and then get saved again, then lose your salvation and get saved again and kind of go back and forth. But here's the problem with that. Both the Second Peter passage and the Hebrews passage, both of them indicate that if you were, in theory, if you could be saved and then lose your salvation, then what? It's gone. There's no getting it back. So uh, what's interesting about that passage is I've heard the Hebrews and the Second Peter passage used by groups quite frequently as proof that you can lose your salvation, but they all believe you can get saved again and then lose it again and then save it again, depending on what the circumstances are at any given time. But if you're going to take those passages at the face value, the reality is if you, if you could get saved and then if you could lose your salvation, then there's no, there's no coming back. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I and I, it does. The salvation does cost. We tend to, we tend to talk about salvation as being easy, and there is a sense that it is. We're not the ones dying on the cross. Uh, we're not the ones being whipped. We're not the ones actually enduring the consequences of our sin. So in that sense, my salvation is easy for me. I don't have to endure what Christ did. Because if I did, I, there's no coming back. I'm, I'm dead. I just, I'm done. 
So I, I can't do what Christ did. So in that sense, yes, my salvation is, is easy. It's simple. But what I've actually done when I come to salvation in Christ is I have handed over the keys of my life to someone else. He has rescued me, but now my life belongs to Him. And there is a change, and there are some results that need to result of that. So one thing I, we didn't talk about yet, how can I know that I'm saved? Well, James talks about this a little bit. There are going to be results. We sometimes use the word fruit. There's going to be behavior changes in me. Now, I'm not saying that any given week or any given month, and our, our Baptist Testament has talked about this, that believers can, in fact, fall into sin for periods of time. And we, and we know that. But over the course of my life, if I am a genuine believer, if I have been regenerated and given new life, if I have a new birth, I'm going to look and act different. If I'm an apple tree, I'm going to produce apples, right? If that tree has pears on it, then it's not an apple tree. Fair? <laughs> Duh. If my life does not have the fruit of the Spirit in it over the course of time, then I, that's a major piece of evidence that works against me. So one other way I can know, by the way, that I'm saying, and John actually speaks of this in the, in the letter of 1 John, we are not saved by those fruits. That's not what makes me a Christian, but it's evident that I am or that I'm not, one way or the other. And if I... Over the course of 10 or 15 years, my life, I say I'm saved, but there's absolutely no evidence about it, there's no fruit, then there's a good reason to question about whether or not my salvation is real. So all these things working together. But ultimately, what I want to get to tonight is we are secure in our salvation for one reason only. Because of who? Because of Christ. Because of God. Not because... I did it, but because he did it. I didn't save me, so I can't unsave me, if that makes sense. Now, obviously, I respond in faith, I, so don't, don't, don't misunderstand me there. But ultimately, he saved me. I didn't rescue myself. I'm the guy drowning in the water without a lifeboat or a life raft or a life you know, preserver. I'm the one who's picked up out of the water. I was rescued. I was saved. I can't unsave me. He did it. So since he did it, I don't have the power. I don't have the power to undo what God did. I just I just put it that way. Now, let me ask you this question. One reason we think about sometimes people wrap people leaving their salvation is because sometimes there are people that we have looked at in our lives. We think to ourselves, they look like they were saved at one point, and they sure don't look like it now. Now I bet you we all know. At least a couple of those. How do we deal with that? How do we understand that? Okay. Well, yep. Anything else? John himself, in his letter of 1 John, talks at one point about this. He says, There were those who were once part of us who left, and by their leaving, had given us, they, 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 evidence that they never really were part of us. They just looked like it. In other words, looks can be deceiving. Take the parable of the four soils that Jesus talked about. I think this is actually one of the more crucial parables that Jesus shares in the Gospels. He describes four situations. He describes four soils. One, the seed, which is the Word of God, the Gospel, bounces off the hard ground. Birds come pick it up. It never even takes root. That's, that's easy enough to understand. And the fourth soil is, boy, it's good soil. The seed goes, the grows, the plants the plant, the plants produce 50, 60, 80, 100 fold, and that's easy. We see that. That's that's believers. That's that's man. Those are easy. 
the two in the middle, the, the thorny, weedy soil and the rocky soil. And both those Jesus describes as those, it appears the seed takes root and grows initially, and then in the case of the rocky soil, the, you know, the sun beats down on it and it dries out and the, 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 there's no real root, root there and the, the plants die and they're thrown away and burned. And then in the, uh, the thorny soil, it describes the thorns and the weeds as choking out those plants and they dying and they're thrown away and burned. And there has been discussion through the years about what, the, what those two mean. Are the thorny soil folks and the rocky soil folks, were those legitimate believers that just got distracted or were they never believers to begin with? I, personally, I'm in the latter category. So I think that actually describes what you can see in several other of Christ's parables, that there are those who look real for a while, but over the course of their lives there's no fruit, and they're thrown away and they're burned. They appear to be genuine believers, but they weren't really, and over time there's no endurance, there's no perseverance. And that lack of endurance, that lack of perseverance, ultimately will shed light on whether or not someone was a genuine believer or not. You and I live in a world where we kind of want instant results and instant conclusions. Um, you know, some of us have lived long enough to, to remember, you know, things didn't happen instantaneously all the time. It took it took a while to find out information. I mean, you know, just just a, this isn't perhaps all that recent. It's been twenty three year, twenty two years ago now. But you know, we live in a world now. We know what, we know what happened. Say, for example, on nine nine eleven. We know what happened. But if you remember, if you lived through nine eleven. We spent days and weeks not knowing what had really happened. It took us a while to get the information. If you go back even further than that, if you go back uh, decades before that, it took a while for information to be figured out and, and made known, didn't it? We didn't know things instantly. You know, I remember the very first microwave oven. <laughs> Some of y'all remember those too, right? You remember when food didn't get reheated in a minute and a half? Now it's like, oh, five minutes, come on. I'm hungry. Some of y'all, man, back in the day, it was, <laughs> was 30 minutes in the oven before something got warmed up again. Um, we live in a world where we want to know things instantly. But the truth is, Scripture says it takes sometimes a long time to know whether or not uh, the endurance and perseverance actually is one of those things that gives evidence. And ultimately, the genuine believer endures, perseveres, and that's part of the evidence that they are, in fact, genuine. And you won't know that in the first six weeks, probably. <laughs> now, that's not the instant answer perhaps we want, but Christianity isn't instant oatmeal. <laughs> you can quote me on that. That's a new one. I just, I just, I just, that's all popped my head right there. That's a bumper sticker right there. Christianity isn't instant oatmeal. Just, I'll patent that and throw it on a bumper sticker. All right. <laughs> Y'all get it. Um, now, we, we're, we're going to wrap this thing up tonight. What we're going to do next week is we're going to go back and look at the first half of this. We've talked about, I believe, that there is eternal security. There is a once saved, always saved. It's based upon the work of God. It's based upon His promises to us. And we can know that we are, in fact, saved. The reason I want to do this, this is something we like. We want to know we have our salvation. But what's the foundation? What's the foundational ideas and grace and glory that God's got behind that? That's going to be the first paragraph that we skip tonight in the Bible section next week. We're going to go back and look at next week. All right. So if you got your, if you have your copy of the Bible section message, and by the way, I do have some extra copies tonight. I know a couple of y'all hadn't gotten them, so if you haven't gotten one, there are extra copies of the creeds of the Bible section message back there. You can grab one if you haven't got one. Go back and read that paragraph on the purpose of grace. So next week we'll jump in to that. All right. If you watch this online tonight, so grateful you are with us. I hope to see you Sunday. I know spring break begins this week, but we have not canceled services. We will have worship service on Sunday morning. Uh, we will meet for spring, even though it's spring break week. And we are going to be looking this week. We are fully now into the plagues of Egypt. And so if you like frogs and bugs and boils, this is your Sunday. So, <laughs> so uh, I hope to see you guys on Sunday. We're going to take some time to pray. I hope you will as well. Y'all have a good evening.